at the University of Malaga. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Castilla-La Mancha, also in Spain. Uh, and before leaving for Malaga, he was <laughs> he was an associate professor at uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics and Computer Science at DTU. Um, so uh, we're really happy uh, to have him back. He was also a speaker at our first summer school. He's the first uh, that we invite back. So <laughs> it will be a very good lecture. <laughs> um, yeah, and his interest, he works uh, on OR and application to uh, energy markets and uh, power systems. And he's done a lot of work on decision making under uncertainty. And he's going to present some of this uh, today. Uh, so I'll let him start. Thank you very much, Lesia. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to thank Lesia, Jalal, and Spiros for inviting me to, to the DTU Summer School. I have enjoyed, and I'm enjoying the experience a lot. As Lesia said, I have very good memories about, uh, from the time where I was a public member here at DTU. So it's really nice to be back and to be able to teach uh, under this hub headquarters one again, once again. So, very, very nice experience. I'm becoming older, so I value these things more and more. Um, as Lesia said, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a very short introduction to contextual decision making and uncertainty. The, there are two main objectives that I have about this lecture. It's a short lecture, so only two objectives. The first objective will be that I would like you to get to know the intuition behind what we mean by contextual decision making under uncertainty. And the second objective is I would like you to get intuition about the different, the wide variety of methods that we have to conduct contextual decision making. This is a field that has been very prolific in the last couple of years, so it's a very recent topic. I mean, stochastic programming, decision making, and uncertainty has been there for more than a decade since even before I started my PhD, I did my PhD. But now we have this other concept, contextual decision making, that we have learned, that we have inherited from the machine learning literature, for casting literature. We are bringing some techniques that they use there for quite a long time. We are bringing them into the analysis of optimization. <clears throat> but first, I would like you to introduce a little bit more myself and my group. Uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, Spain and Malaga, this is where I come from, the very south of Spain. There we have a small group, OASIS, Optimization Analytic for Sustainable Energy Systems. I can tell you that uh, Malaga is a very nice place to work and to live in. We have this kind of weather all over the year. So it's a very sun, uh, very sunny city, and also it's 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 gaining a lot of attention, international attention, because we have one of the largest, the third largest airport, international airport in Spain, and uh, many companies, many big techs are placing headquarters right now in Malaga. So it's becoming kind of the, the Barcelona of the south of Spain, like for example Google, Vodafone, and others. So just to, because the University of Malaga is not so popular, it's not so very well known, just to give you an insight, to give you uh, um, a highlight about Malaga so that people start getting to, uh, getting to know it a little bit better. Uh, so acknowledgements, I have to acknowledge the, mainly these three people that you can see there, Salvador Pineda, who is the co-leader of the group, and uh, Adrián Esteban Pérez and Miguel Ángel Muñoz. Uh, these are the two PhD students on which, on which uh, thesis, all what I'm going to talk about here is, uh, is based. Okay, Miguel Ángel Muñoz has already left uh, to work for the private sector in an OR company. And Adrián Esteban Pérez is now leading the, uh, like, next week to work for the University of Rotterdam, of Erasmus Rotterdam, as a postdoc researcher. Okay, so what do we understand by contextual decision making? And this is a classical example that, we know, uh, that, that I use a lot. Uh, imagine that we're running an ice cream shop, okay? And we need to decide at 10 a.m. in the morning, we need to decide how much ice cream we are going to make for the day. 
This will be our decision, the decision that we have to make now, here and now, decision X. But at 10 a.m., we don't know the demand pricing that will happen in the afternoon. This is our uncertain parameter we have to deal with. This is the uncertain parameter Y. Okay? But what we know is that is the temperature at 10 a.m. Okay? This is what we call the context or the feature variable, the variable set. Okay? And we presume that the temperature in the morning will have a major effect or will be correlated uh, with the demand for ice cream in the afternoon. Right? So the idea basically is that we would like to exploit such a relationship between the temperature in the morning that we know, the contact is something that we know beforehand, to decide about how much ice cream we are going to produce uh, to feed, to, to fulfill the demand in the afternoon. So this is a very simple decision, contextual decision making problem. The context is the temperature, the uncertain parameter is the ice cream, the demand for ice cream, and the decision that we have to make is how much ice cream we are going to produce. Okay? Also, contextual decision making problems are also referred to in the mathematical programming literature as conditional stochastic optimization problem. Uh, conditional stochastic problem. Okay, so my major, my ultimate goal of this presentation, of this lecture, is for you to learn something. Okay, so a disclaimer, nothing that, basically nothing that you're going to see here is realistic. I'm going to use all along the presentation a toy example. We're going to work with that toy example because my major objective is for you to learn the method, to understand. Okay, so not intended to be realistic at all, just intended to learn something from it, hopefully. We're going to use a very simplistic to a stage economic dispatch problem that probably most of you are familiar with. Who knows the economic dispatch problem? I mean, I have seen some presentations about the economic dispatch. That's great, because then you have the basis to learn. Okay, to a stage economic dispatch. Very simple. We are going to have two producers, two generators, G1 and G2, and only one load that have to be met, that have to be satisfied. We are not going to have network constraints. We don't have time to deal with network constraints. They are a major source of complication. So we don't have time in this lecture to deal with them. The, the, the aim is to decide the power dispatch of G1 and G2, the two generators, so that the load L is satisfied at minimum cost. Okay? These are the data that I'm going to since I have these wonderful boards. I'm going to copy the data here so that we can uh, carry them along during the presentation because this is like we up here. So we have G1, and the data for G1 is it has a marginal production cost. I have forgotten about the units, but all throughout the presentation, the units are euros megawatt hour for the cost and powers in megawatt energy megawatt hour. Okay? So it's going to be five. Uh, euros uh, per megawatt hour, and then the minimum power output is going to be zero megawatt, and the maximum power output is going to be for this 160. Then we have G2, okay, that has a marginal production cost of 20, and then a minimum power output minimum power output limit of zero and a maximum power output limit of one half. These are our basic data. Then we have the load. The load it can be a net load, it could be load minus renewable energy uh, production is uncertain. So and this is this is the joint distribution, the joint probability distribution, very simplistic, it's a discrete distribution. We know that loads are not discrete, are continuous, uh, continuous random variables, right? But for our case, it's going to be discrete. This is the joint distribution of our load, which is uncertain. You will see here two parameters. The load itself, L, the real load, the actual load, 
which can take three, six different values. The ones that you see here. Six realization, six support points, or six uh, scenarios that you may want to refer to them. Okay? Here we have the different values of the load, L1 equal to 90, L2 equal to 40, and so on. One, two, three, four, five, six, and the associated probabilities of, of, of occurrence. Okay? And we can distinguish two bunches of scenarios, two groups, two branches. The upper branch is associated with a mean, a forecast, a conditional expectation, a forecast, a point forecast is a conditional expectation, an expectation given the information available at that point that we want to forecast. So this LF is the forecast. So we have two possible events. The forecast is 50, and if you do the math, 50 is the average of these three scenarios. So we have unbiased forecast, like a proper forecast. Forecast should be unbiased. So they should represent the conditional expectation of what is coming next. Okay, and then we have another event, which is the forecast equal to 100 which again is the conditional mean, is the mean of this conditional distribution, okay, of a scenarios for five and six, uh, uh, and the probabilities, okay? So if you do the average, taking into account the weighted average, you will, you will get one half, okay? This is the reality. This is not known in practice. This is something I have to guess for data, right? But from now on, we will assume that we are playing the role of kind of a god, and God knows this reality. Okay? Okay. This is what I just said. We have the joint distribution, and if you do the math, the 50, the forecast, is equal to the weighted average of the first three scenarios, and the 100 is the average of the three other scenarios. I'm insisting on this because otherwise, it could be that I introduce an artificial bias to get my results that you're going to see here. Artificial, okay, no? Here, our forecasts are unbiased, as they should be. Okay. Um, yes. Since this is a two-stage economic dispatch, we have two stages. It will be a forward stage, where we plan the production, and a real-time stage, well, we have to deal with imbalances due to the uncertainty of the load. This is classical in markets. We have several stages of decisions in markets to deal with deviations of the load. Okay? So our G1 is what we call an inflexible unit, such a like a very big nuclear power plant. So it will have some upward regulation for upward balancing energy when we have to satisfy more energy than expected. And we have a downward regulation cost. So the upward regulation cost of this unit is equal to 50. And you can see that the unit is inflexible because its marginal production cost is 5, but the upward regulation cost is 50. So it means if you want to move, if you want me to move upward my production. It's going to cost me a lot because I'm very, a very big power plant, a very slow power plant, so my cost will be very high. Okay? <clears throat> and a downward regulation cost equal to minus 20. A downward regulation cost is a repurchase cost. A repurchase cost it means that it's money that the producer um, gives back to the market because I'm decreasing my production, so I have to pay back my production. In this case, since the unit is inflexible, minus 20 means that if you want me to decrease my production, not only I'm going to save my marginal production cost, but you have to pay me also in addition 20 euros per hour hour because I'm very inflexible. Okay? On the other hand, we have the flexible unit which has an upward regulation cost equal to 21. This is, for example, a small gas turbine, okay, which are very quick. They react very quickly, or a hydropower turbine. Okay, so 21. See the difference. 
Now, 20 the marginal production cost, 21 the hour regulation cost. I'm so flexible, I don't, I don't care if I have to be dispatched. One hour in advance, two, 24 hours in advance, or 15 minutes in advance, I'm good enough. So my cost doesn't increase. And then the downward regulation cost, which is equal to uh, 20. So it means there is no opportunity cost between the day ahead and between the forward and the real time market because they're very flexible. They can do this at, uh, to a certain extent. You have technical limits, for example, and that's what these RU and RD means. It's the amount of upper regulation or tower regulation they can provide for technical limits or for other reasons. So the other regulation this one can provide is 10. And the downward regulation this one can provide is 60. And by the way, if you, you are more than welcome to raise your hand and ask a question whenever you want during the presentation. And actually, I, I would fire it because it allows me to, to raise my voice. So, R to you equal to 100. This is this is so flexible that all the capacity is offered as regulation. It's actually um, the, the role that normally plays, at least back in the day, the gas turbine. Gas turbines are the major regulators, for example, in Spain. So most of their business is in the regulating market. So this is an expansion. This is kind of a ramping constraint. It's a simplification of a ramping constraint. We could say that. Okay? But we don't have time periods here. We have two decision stages, but this is a very simple stage. Like a ramping constraint between all three decisions. Exactly. Something like that. Actually, this would be a multi period state or even multi state decision making process in reality. Okay, so this is now the abstraction of our problem. The idea we have two stages a dispatch. So, uh, our objective in this case is to minimize the dispatch cost. Then, what we know in the dispatch phase, as you can see there, is the forecast. The forecast is something that we know because we fabricate it, or we have a provider, a provider that provides us with the forecast. So, this is something that we know. In, if we do the analogy with the ice cream shop, the forecast is the context, it's what we know for sure, what we have, the information that we have received or that we have fabricated. Okay, given the forecast, this is the only thing that I know, I have to decide on P1 and P2, the production of the two generators, in the face of uncertain demand, to minimize the spark cost. Then, the actual realization of the load happens, this is scenario omega prime that happens, and then we have to redispatch our generator using regulation, upward regulation and downward regulation. And then our objective there, as always, is to minimize redispatch costs. Okay? <coughs> so now, your turn. This is a, it's a, it's a simple, simple but very instructive example. So how would you formulate mathematically the sequence? And this is very important. I have described this problem as a sequence of dispatch. Dispatch, redispatch. How would you formulate it? To make, it, to make things easier and quicker, how would you reformulate that problem? The first one. How would you formulate it mathematically? Yeah. No, there are no binary. Everything that I'm saying here applies when you have binary variables, when you have network constraint, at the cost of having a huge mathematical program to solve. Here, we are using this toy example because it's very easy to, to solve. The code is very simple to implement. It's something that you could do. Uh, if we had more time, you could do your solve the code. So how do you formulate the first stage? Like an optimization problem, I mean. Just uh, power balance. It's a power balance. So the power balance, we need to use, can you see this more well? Okay, the power balance would be P1 plus P2 equal to forecast to load. Forecast to load. 
What is the objective function? You don't need to read, don't need to raise your hand, just speak up. Okay. Minimize C1 to 1. P2. And then we are just missing the capacity constraints, right? So this would be the minimum power output, and the, and the, but we know that they are zero. Okay, yes. So this is our first stage. What is the solution to this optimization problem, and that's why I'm choosing it? What is the solution to this optimization problem? It's analytical. You don't need to, you don't need to use Google, Cplex uh, to solve this problem. What is the solution? So knowing that C1 is a speed to lower than C2. Exactly. So it's let's say let's put it this way. Well, in general it would be P1, this is it means optimal equal to LL if LL is lower, no? If not if LF is lower than or equal to right? And then the rest it will be um, equal to this, right? And P2 equal to LF minus if LF is greater than since we know that uh, the, the, the forecasted load cannot be higher than 100, we don't have the third piece. It would be a third piece in the case in the case that the forecast um, load would be higher than the, the sum of the maximum capacity, 160. But we don't we don't have that, that situation, so there is not a third piece. That would be a solution. That would be feasible. That would be a feasible optimization problem. Okay. The, what about the ready dispatch? The ready dispatch is equally easy, but we have, you have to write more because there are more constraints and so on. So we are we are going to to see it here. But as you can see, it's very simple, but with more constraints, right? I'm going to explain the constraints. So one first, we solve this problem. We have already solved it, okay? There and. Once you solve this problem, you provide the optimal solution to this one. This is what I call P1 star, P2 star, like there. And then we have to do the redispatch. The redispatch is another optimization problem very similar to the first one with the upward regulation cost. With the upward regulation cost that you have there. This one, upward regulation cost. Okay, minus the downward regulation cost because it, the, the downward regulation cost, as I said, are a record change price. You are decreasing your production, so you have to sell back your production into the market. So you become a consumer. Okay, the only thing is that this inflexible unit doesn't want to sell back production into the market, and that's why it, it costs net. Okay, this is for a particular scenario of the load. A certain realization of the load. That's why we have we have the omega prime. This means a particular event. Okay. Then we have the power balance, the real time dispatch power balance, which is the upward regulation minus the downward regulation is equal to the load minus the forecast in our case. Okay. That is the deviation of the load with respect to the forecast. The forecast error. Okay, then we have the constraints on the upward regulation and downward regulation that each, each unit can provide, okay, based on these capacities here. And finally, we have that the upward regulation of generating unit at most can be the capacity of that unit minus the production already committed to the forward market. 
to the forward dispatch. Okay? The same for uh, generator 2 and the downward regulation can be at most my current production, my forward production. I cannot sell back more energy than the one I have already committed in the forward dispatch. Okay, I cannot decrease my production more than, uh, than reaching the zero. Okay, so this is the red dispatch. Okay, so far so good. Very simple. Everybody understand it? Okay. The solution, the analytical solution to this problem, what you have here, is normally referred to as a merit order dispatch or as a fulfilling of the supply demand curve. Okay, our demand curve is a uh, vertical line because it's, it's, a, it's a data point, right? Okay, it's a merit order dispatch, which means that cheapest units are dispatched first. This is because we don't have narrow constraints. Okay? But everything that I'm going to say here applies also with narrow constraints. Okay. You said, and well said, what is the demand in the forward dispatch? And one of your colleagues very well said, applying the logic, the, uh, the current practice, said the forecast. But this presentation and this lecture is about arguing why we have to employ here the forecast. Why the forecast? I say, let's be general. This is just a certain estimate of the load. Maybe the forecast, maybe 0 0.8 quantile, quantile forecast. It could be something else. Why the forecast? This is what they use in practice right now, but why? Okay? And this is where the power of contextual decision making is going to come into play. <coughs> okay, this is the process that I explained before. First, we solve the merit or the dispatch. The merit or the dispatch feeds the red dispatch, and then we provide, we, uh, we decide on the regulation of the units. Okay, so this is going to be the main topic of our presentation a certain estimate of the load. I remember the joint distribution of the forecast, which is the conditional expectation and the scenario realization. This is, this is known, again, by God. <coughs> and we are going to play the role by God until I say otherwise. Okay? LF. This is what we proposed. I used to say that Solve the problem in the problem, you say you know exactly what yeah, the yeah, that's, that's not realistic, but it would allow us to learn step by step. We are playing the, God, the, the, the role of a person that knows everything perfectly. So we do not take into account the probability. Right now, we are not taking that probability into account. We are not being intelligent enough. Okay? But this is a this is a certain estimate of the law. Is this is the why is the most widely used uncertain estimate of the law? The conditional expectation is the more intuitive. Intuitive, right? So if the forecast is 50, I put 50 there. If the forecast is 100, I put 100 there. And that's what forecasts normally advocate for. That's why they do, they try their best to, pro to produce very good forecast. Okay. So let's see what happens if we use the forecast. Suppose there are two possible events regarding the forecast. We have only two values. We have, I want to go backward. Okay, thank you. We have 50 and 100. Let's see what happens if we have 50. So if we have 50, we have that branch of the tree. Okay, if we have 50, we apply the merit order and we get P1 equal to 50, which is the, the cheapest generator, P2 equal to 0. Then we go, we plug that optimization decision variables, we plug them into the ready patch and we, and we do the math. And the math tells us that if it's a scenario 90 realizes, then I have to increase the power production of generator to 40. 50 plus 40 is the 90 equal to, uh, equal in the demand. 
Okay? We do the math. 40 multiplied by 21 plus 50 multiplied by 5. This 50 is a cost of this generator. Okay? 5 multiplied by 50, which is the P1 star. 40, which is the upper regulation provided by the gas turbine. Multiplied by 21, this is the cost of fulfilling the demand in that specific realization. We do the same for realization 40. In this case, we need to resort to downward regulation. And you see the downward regulation, since the only unit that has been dispatched in the forward state is the, the inflexible unit, this one, the upward regulation, the downward re regulation is very costly. It's minus 20. Minus, multiplied by minus 20 is something positive, okay? And then we do the same for the third scenario. So these are the costs per realization. We multiply by the probabilities of occurrence that we have there as well, and we do the average, and the expected cost, the expected cost is 453. Okay? We repeat this process for when the event is the forecast equal to 100. In this case, we apply the merit of the dispatch since generating unit one hits the maximum capacity, then we have to dispatch generator two, the gas turbine. We, we again, we plug this information, we, got, we plug this optimization, these uh, optimal variables into the dispatch. We can do again the math. For a scenario 150, we have to use the upper regulation of the gas turbine. For a scenario 120, we also have to use the upper regulation of the gas turbine. And for a scenario 40, in this case, we have to use the downward regulation of both the flexible unit gas uh, turbine and the inflexible unit, the central, uh, the, the big uh, uh, nuclear power plant. We do the math again, and this is the cost that we get. Okay? This is the summary. Okay? This is the summary. This is the math that we have done. In the previous slide, and we take the expectation, which is a weighted expectation because the scenarios have different probabilities, and this is the expected cost that we got, we're going to get in the end. This is the expected cost, the actual expected cost of the forecast approach, the forecasting approach, where the uncertain uh, estimate of the load is made equal to the forecast. Okay? These are the, the ready spots you can hear. It's because I'm going to use this format for the table during all the presentation. So here we have the, this is the ready spatch decision variables. These are the dispatch decision variables. This is the forecast. This is the estimate of the load in the forward dispatch. In our case, it's equal to the forecast because this was our decision. Okay, do it like this. This is the actual load and the respective probability of the scenario. Okay, we are going to make two breaks. I don't know what time is it. A quarter to ten. Okay, then we are going to continue a little bit more, and then we at ten we will do we will do a break. This is total cost. Yes, is the total cost over. Yeah. This is the total cost. It's expected expected total cost when you compute all the possible things that can happen based on these three here. Based on these three, which is reality, okay, for us is the reality, we do all the possible combination of what can happen, we do the average, and that's the cost that we get. Okay, yes? Yeah, we only, we are doing a sequence, like it is done today in markets. We first, we first, I mean, I know that some of you know stochastic programming and all these kind of things. This can be done in another way, we will get to that, but in our, in our case, it's like it is done right now. First, the first stage, then the second stage, myopically, okay? Any other question? This one? Uh, yeah, so, so we have a 50% probability of forecast 50 
And 50% for the other one, yes. Yeah, that, that we, we have our provider of the forecast. It means that our forecaster, uh, our provider of the forecast is always giving us 50 or 100. 50 or 100. That's it. I mean, it's unrealistic. It's not like that because it's a, we know that the load is a continuous variable, so the forecast should be varied continuously, but it's just for this, uh, for this example. Okay? Yeah. Just to confirm, in the table, when you see the table, did this go in the dispatch first and the phone, and then we optimize the dispatch to separate from it? Yes, the, the redispatch is a separate problem. Okay, so that's like, from a certain dispatch, it's not the. the exactly. Is this what, yes, exactly. So, as I said, is what we do. We solve this problem, and then this problem feeds P1 star and P2 star to the other one. Any other question? Yeah. So for the uh, inverse is we always try to add a bit of In this, we are starting, so in this approach in which we logically say, okay, what should I put here? I ask, what should I put there? Um, your colleague said, the forecast. It seems like a reasonable assumption, and it's actually what they do uh, uh, nowadays. No, no, it's over. what I know, and this is very important in contextual decision making, what I know here is only the forecast, only the context. Our context, our set variable in the ISP shop is going to be the forecast. This is what I know because I'm, I have been provided with that information either because I, I fabricated it myself or because I had a provider of forecast. That's what I know now. I don't know what is going to happen in the future in the real time. Okay? No, I know, yes, uh, no, so let's clarify this. I know when I make a decision, yes, and this is confusing because maybe I, I, I didn't pass it. Yes. When I'm doing the math, when I'm doing this math, when I'm doing this math, I'm playing the role of a God, of God. So God is doing this math because, so God is evaluating my decisions. But when I'm making the decision, I'm playing the role of a human being. Okay? Where I only know the forecast. Do we understand the difference? So for the evaluation of what I'm doing, is God doing the evaluation? Or nature, let's say. Nature is doing the evaluation because it knows reality. But when I'm making decisions, I only know the forecast. I'm a human being. So I don't know what is coming next. Okay? So it's because during the presentation we have to we will have to apply a method to solve a decision making problem and we will value, we will be evaluating the performance of applying that method. Who evaluates the performance? Nature. Who has to make the decision? The human being. Okay? The human being knows only the context. Nature knows everything. Okay. And when you say you only know the forecast, you only know the singular value. You exactly. Know it could be that we know something else, but yeah. for yeah. this, it's only the value, the point forecast. We could have a probabilistic forecast, and it's also fine. But here, we only know the point forecast, just to make it simple, things simple. Okay? Great. So, let's go back, and let's, again, question ourselves about the uncertain estimate of the load. Another, and here is where contextual decision making comes into stage, instead of plugging directly the load as a human being, as a decision maker, I can think of something else, right? For example, we could say, instead of the forecast that I received from the provider, okay, Instead of the forecast, I'm going to modify the forecast. And how I'm going to modify the forecast? In the simplest possible way, using a linear and a fine function, what we call kind of a fine 
policy. I'm going to perturb, I'm going to modify my product ads in an affine form. So A and B are the affine parameters in such a way that once I receive the forecast, I modify it and then I plug the result into here. Okay? Do we understand that? So the question is, how do we compute A and B? You go to the the one of modifying, yes. The idea is to try to do something clever, more clever than just plugging the, the forecast, the conditional expectation. We are trying to, to, to know methods to do something more clever. Okay? So, how the, so I'm going to modify the forecast. The forecast works as we saw in this table. And I would like to get something better than this. One possible solution that has been proposed in the literature is to say, let's modify the forecast. But then the question that pops up is, how do we compute the rule? This is what we call a parametric rule. How do a parametric rule of the context? The context is the forecast, the information that we have about it. How do we compute A and B? Any possible idea? Yeah, you minimize the expected cost. Since I want to minimize, by my, my overall goal is to, to try to make this amount as low as possible, right? This one here. As low as possible, right? So to compute A and B, I'm going to try to minimize that amount. It makes sense. That's what mathematical programming is about. Mathematical programming is a, about what do you want to do? I want to minimize this. Then minimize it. Is there a formulation of how many parameters do you need to actually compute the minimum? Well, I, is, there is no, I mean, I have two parameters because this is the decision that I made. As a human being, I say, well, the, the way I'm going to modify the forecast is by this affine rule. It could be another one. It could be ALF plus CLF squared plus DLF to the cube. Yeah, the question is basically like... How many? Yeah. Uh, that's something that we have. I'm not going to talk about that here, but we are just going to stick to the linear thing. But it could be, yes, that's a, that's, it could be a, it's a, it's a, even a non-linear. Yeah. Is, is it even solvable? Yeah. How many? It's, this, is a, this is basically an, an inherited technique from the forecasting literature, so everything that you can do there, more or less you can do it here. Yeah, well. Okay, um, I, I guess you're doing this because you want to uh, minimize the consequences of the realization. So exactly. The realization was like really bad, then we didn't really screw up so much. So um, my question is, um, why don't you even, like, why don't you think about in, uh, improving your forecast in the first place because you're ready. To do yeah, it. but then, but then the the my my answer is easy because nature's reality is that simple. There is no way to improve the forecast understood as a conditional mean, as a point forecast. The best forecast you can have from that tree is 50 for the first branch and. 100 for the second branch. The forecast is defined as the expectation of my uncertain parameter given the context. Um, uh, yeah, well, something like that. Well, I, but it's, it's a conditional expectation. So the best forecast you can have for the three scenarios is the mean of those scenarios, the weighted mean. So here there is, a, I'm using the perfect, for, I'm using the, the ideal forecast. It's unbiased, um, well calibrated, and so on. Okay. Okay. So you said that in order to compute A and B, the idea is to minimize the um, the expectation. Okay. This is minimizing expectation. This is minimizing the expectation. For those of you who are familiar with stochastic programming, this is like a stochastic program, a two-stage stochastic program. 
So what we do, I want to minimize this taxation. So I plug in, do you remember the two problems that we have here? These two problems, what I do, I put them together in a single problem, in a single minimization problem, with the three, the six possible scenarios. Okay, and this is what I get. These are my rule, this is my parametric rule. You see that instead of L hat, what I have now is my rule. Okay? So given the forecast, I'm plugging A forecast plus B. This is the modification of the rule that I want to compute optimally. And that's why I'm solving this problem. This is the expectation of the cost for all the scenarios. Right? Okay, and here I have to repeat the constraints that we saw before, the first stage constraint and the second stage constraint for all the scenarios. Okay? This is a problem, again, that, call, that only nature or God can solve. Because only nature and God, and we will see what the human being actually does a little bit later, but God could solve this problem because he knows all the possible scenarios of the law. So he knows, uh, 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 they know the omega. Nature knows the omega. Okay? So, nature knows this, and nature, only nature, can solve that problem. If we do that, so the idea, I forgot to say that, of course, the idea to solve this problem is to compute A and B. So what I'm doing is give me the A and B to modify in an affine form the forecast in such a way that the expectation of the cost is minimized. This resembles, this, is a, this actually is a two-stage stochastic problem. Okay? If we do this, the optimal solution that we get is A equal to 1 and B equal to 4. This means that our rule is the following. This is our rule. The estimate of the load, the estimate of the load, this estimate of the load is no longer the forecast itself, but we have to modify it 40. Okay? And this is the same table as before, exactly the same table as we have before. And na now nature is doing the math again. Nature is doing the math. What would happen if I apply that rule to solve this two-stage economic dispatch? And this is what happens. <coughs> this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. To prove it, like yeah. you mean mathematically prove it, or yeah, or explain intuitively why? Because yeah, that would make sense, right? yes, so the, the intuition is that the forecast is this conditional expectation of a probability distribution. But natural systems, they are not linear. They are not linear in the sense that the the cost of nature is asymmetric. Sometimes upward regulation, like here, upward regulation. Upward regulation could be less costly than downward regulation or the other way around. And that's something that is not taken into account by the forecaster. We operation researchers or optimizers, we say the forecast is a statistical thing. You have computed from the data using a statistical criteria, which is to try to get the conditional expectation of my probability distribution, right? But optimizers say, hey, that's not the best criterion to get a forecast because my system is asymmetrical. The cost of my system is asymmetrical. So maybe it's better to bias my forecast right here. What I'm doing here, this is introduce a bias in my forecast. I am saying that the best thing I can do is that I receive my forecast and I bias it upward. Why? Because as you can see here, I'm going to use downward regulation which is very cheap 
and upward regulation from the, from the flexible unit that is very cheap. So I bias upward my forecast in such a way that I can use the flexible generator, which is very cheap to do regulation. This is what it's telling us. And this is, sorry, this is the outcome. What I, have, what I have just done here, what I have just done here is to take the outcome of this optimization problem and put it on a table. This table is the outcome of the optimization problem. This is what we get from the previous optimization problem, which is a linear optimization problem. Yes? I'm sorry to put the. I guess the problem is that given that a human being so interested in the optimization problem as the reading scenario is present, you're going to see the problem of like, a human being and not a human being, but a human solution, and not a scientist, somehow to create scenarios for the organization. So yes. Like yes. So I guess there's some intuition of either not normally computational or. No, no, that's something that we can do, and we will see that we can do that as well. I mean, and trying to introduce the method okay. little by little. In, in, in normally, what you would do is to try to solve with the scenarios, right? Yeah. For those of you who know about the stochastic program. Yes. But I'm introducing the method little by little, and we will gain complexity as we go through the presentation. No, I'm trying not to estimate the load. I'm trying to I'm trying to decide because this is not a statistics. This is optimization. I'm trying to decide which value I have to put here in such a way that the solution to this optimization problem is what giving me the best minimization of the cost in the second stage. That's what I'm doing. So my main objective is not to have a good forecast. My main objective is to have the best decision. Okay? And decision and forecast are not always aligned. They can be different. Now, okay? when you solve this problem and you have like the A's and B's, uh, you just use it in the future, for example. So yes, once you have these, you use it in the future. So you, once you estimate the A and B, every time that you receive a new forecast, you do that bias, you do plus 40, and that's what you plug into your optimization problem. Okay? Uh, so you're saying that because the, for the forecaster, uh, the asymmetry of the problem is not important, but for us it's important because the For operational researchers, it's very important. Yeah, upper and downward rotation. Yeah. So that's why you buy support. Exactly. Uh, can we explain that if our problem is also symmetric, then the yes, uh, If you have a symmetric, your, de your decision cost is symmetric. The best you can do, that's it, and this is proved, the best you can do is the conditional forecast. And B becomes zero. Yeah, B becomes zero. Yes. But I have prepared the problem, and, and actually, in practice, imagine that, we have, imagine that we have here network constraints, binary variables, or something like that. It's not going to be symmetric at all. Okay, with, with probability zero. Okay, so. Yes. We need to solve now the problem and the non anticipability constraint. Yes. Okay, right. Yes. <laughs> now I'm going to. It's, he's my PhD student, so he knows about this. Okay. And this is where we are going to leave it. And then we go to, to, to the break. Is there something wrong here? Is there something weird? Now you can have the coffee, and in the meantime, you have this table in your head. You see the, the, the numbers here, and you can tell me whether there is something weird, something that is not logical in this table. Okay? And you can discuss it among yourself. But I can tell you that there is something not wrong. This is the outcome of this This is the outcome of this, of this optimization problem. Okay? But there is something that this optimization problem is not doing well. What is that? Let's have a break, a small break, five to ten minutes. Ah, okay, yes. So we can come back at quarter past ten. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 
So what I do is I receive the forecast 50, I use the parametric rule, I bias the forecast upward, I sum 40, right? I have 40 and I have 90. I take that 90, I put it here, and I solve this optimization problem. That's the idea. That's what we want to get. But look what the previous problem is doing. When I receive 50, I put 90, and what I get is 60. 30. This constraint is fulfilled. But then I receive the same thing. I, I get, I have the same context, exactly the same context. 50, I plug in 90, but look what happens. I, I get 40, 50. Again, the power balance is satisfied. But then again, I, I get another 50. I plug in 90 and I get a different solution. 20, 70, 90. That's weird because that, that, that doesn't represent the optimization process that I want to solve. Because we know if I if I plug here 90, what should be the solution to this optimization problem? 50 for P1 and 40 for the, no, pardon, 60 for the, for the first one, and 30 for the second one. If I put here 90, it should be 60, 30. If I put 100, it should be 60 and 40. But I'm getting different values depending on the scenario. This is a typical issue in optimization and uncertainty, and it's called that I'm anticipating the future. The previous optimization problem is anticipating the future. Okay? It doesn't work. I have a question. Yes. To me, it's unclear why is it bad to anticipate the future if you have some insight in the. Is it by, by its, I mean, uh, Per se, anticipating the future, I mean, beyond that it causes you stress, anticipating the future is okay, but the thing is that we cannot guess the future. When I say anticipating the future, it means that I'm using information that I don't know at the moment I'm making the decision. Yes, so, so it was dependent on the, on the PIW, and you do, don't have this in practice, and that's the problem. Exactly. We don't have that in practice. The only thing that I have, when I'm running the ice cream shop, the only thing that I have is the temperature at 10 a.m. I don't know the demand for ice cream. Yeah. Okay? So what I know here is the 50 and the 100. I don't know anything else. Okay? But with the same information, I'm making different decisions. That doesn't happen in reality. Okay? That cannot happen because then it's because I'm using that. The previous optimization problem is wrongly using future information that I don't have in practice. And these, and these are the consequences of that. Okay. The optimization is anticipating the future. So let's see why that is bad. What I'm going to do here now, what I'm going to do here now, is to take the decision rule, the parametric rule, computed by the, this problem, which is 140, and I'm going to use it in practice. So now it's, Nature evaluating my rule, as if I were applying that rule in practice, okay? How, I, how, I do, how do I implement that? I take the rule, okay? Every time that I get a forecast, I sum 40, and the decision of this, of this optimization problem is flat in the real-time dispatch. And this is what I actually get. This is how nature actually evaluates my, my parametric rule. You see now, nature is nature. So now, every time that I get 50, I, pl I plug in, I sum, I add 40, I get 90, I take the base 90, I put it here, I solve this optimization problem, I get the optimization variables, 
I, I do the already dispatch for the different scenario organizations. As you see now, 60, 30. This is the decision that we know that uh, this optimization problem had, right? When I plug in 90 here, the optimal decision of this to this problem is 60, 30. Nature is doing things right, okay? And when I and when I receive a contest 100, I put 140 in this optimization problem, and the solution is 60, 80. Okay? But when I apply my decision moving practice and nature evaluates my parametric rule, look the expected cost that I really get. This is the expected cost that I really get. My optimization problem said that I was going to get this expected cost, but when I apply that rule in practice, the actual expected cost that I get is 31 bigger. So my previous methodology is wrong, it's cursed, because it's anticipating the future, and in reality I cannot anticipate the future. Okay? So we have to do something else. What is going on here? How can we solve this? We have to solve, we have to modify my previous optimization problem so that I, so it doesn't anticipate the future. So let's do that. How do we do that? Mathematical programming. That's mathematical programming. Hey, I don't want to anticipate the future. Put the necessary constraint not to anticipate the future. So let's put the necessary constraint to not to anticipate the future. These are the non-anticipativity constraints. This is exactly doing what I want the optimization problem to do. I am saying, given two different scenarios with different with different Sorry, given two different scenarios with the same context information, with the same forecast, with the same temperature at 10 a.m. in my ice cream, then guarantee that the dispatch is the same. So don't modify the dispatch anticipating the future. If the context is the same, your decision has to be the same. Okay, that's what I'm telling the mathematical program to do with constraints. Okay, this is these are called non-anticipative. Well, these are not called any uh, anything because well, I call it non-anticipativity constraint because they resemble the non-anticipativity constraint of the classical stochastic program. Okay, because it's the same the same notion. Can you, can you go back to your table? This one? Yes. Uh, so that constraints you're putting, they're working because you have a first scenario that you have ninety. As a power, right? But if, if you wouldn't have that 90 as a sorry that uh, huh? 90 as a real demand, if it wasn't if it was lower, uh, then no, no. But I mean, here I have three different possible demand: 90, 40, 20. Yeah, but uh, let's say if you instead of having 90, 40, 20, you have 10, 20, 40, then you would you wouldn't you make as well could make that wrong decision of uh, oversupplying the second generator because you know that the lead dispatch is lower, or, or that's not? Uh, I, if I, I don't know exactly what you mean, but I mean, if I change the values of the, the load, uh, you yeah, would yeah, obtain yeah. the same thing. Okay. Not, not the same numbers, other numbers, but the same conclusion. Yeah, but also the, the, the mean would be different, I think. So. Uh, the mean would be different, the forecast yeah. would be different. Okay? Exactly. Because we are assuming unbiased forecast. Yeah. So if you change the values, your forecast has to change. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Uh, okay. So these are the non anticipativity constraints. These are the non anticipativity constraints, okay? And uh, this is the get that we get, this is the table that we get, exactly the same table, but with the non anticipativity constraints included. That's, that's, that's what I mean. This is still wrong, right? Because you're anticipating that the lead dispatch cost is lower than just well, 50 and 20. And 60 and this 30. is wrong. This is weird. Not, I mean, this is what we get from the previous optimization problem. It's wrong, but not because of that. Okay. Uh, now we, I mean, we managed to get, we managed to get what we wanted. You see, if the if the context is the same, if the context is the same, the dispatch is the same, doesn't change, right? 
If the contest is 100, the dispatch is 50, 100. If the contest is 50, it's always 20 and 70. The mathematical program is doing what we are asking it to do. But there is something still we are here. Right? If we look at this. We're not minimizing that cost. Exactly. That's the problem. We know that if I put here 50, if I put here uh, 50, my optimal decision should be uh, 50 and 0, right? 50 and 0. And if I put 100, my optimal decision should be 60 and 40. So, and I don't get 50, 0, and 60 and 40. I don't get that. No, sorry. Uh, I, uh, yes, because, sorry, I forgot to say, I do things, uh, when I add this constraint, sorry, when I add this constraint, of course, my parametric rule changes. That's why I forgot to say. I have this optimization problem. I add the non activity constraints. I solve this optimization problem for A and B, okay, which is the, the purpose of the whole thing, and I get new A and B. Okay, I get new A and B. Now, the root that I get is 1.2 for a class plus 30. See that the parametric rule is different. The previous one was LF40. My previous one with no anticipatory constraint was this one. Okay, that's the one that we, are, we were getting before. Now I'm getting, when I add non anticipatory constraints, when I add non anticipatory constraints, I get. It's a different rule, you know? I get two different ways of modifying my forecast. Okay, that, I forgot to say that. Then, I achieve what I wanted, is that for the same context, I get the same dispatch, okay? If I apply, if I apply this rule, you see that we get 50 multiplied by 1.2 is 60, plus 30 is 90. If I plot uh, 90, right? And if I have 100, I have 100 multiplied by 1.2 is 120 plus 30 is 150. Okay? But the problem, as, well, as uh, we were talking about before, is that I know that if I put here 50, the optimal decision for this problem must be 50, 0, not 20 and 70. And if I plot here 100, the optimal decision to this problem should be 60 and 40. Uh, not, no, yeah. If I plug here, if I plug here 90, the optimal decision should, should be 60 and 30. And if I plug here 150, my optimal decision should be here 60 and 90. Yes. Because uh, what we have, what we put there is this 90 and 150. Okay. This 90 is what we have to put the estimate. This estimate is what we put here. Okay, so we don't put 50 and 100, we put 90 and 150. For 90, this is 60 and 30, and for 150, is 60 and 90. Um, it's unclear to me why that should be the case, but you want to take the, the, the cost in the second stage into account, right? What is, what is not clear? So now, I, what, how, I, how I understand what you're saying is that in the first stage you want uh, to only use the cheapest, uh, to optimally use the cheapest uh, generator, but that isn't necessarily the case, right? If you want to take the RAM down, the, the predictions of the RAM. Yeah, no. Here I'm using the the. If you see, here I'm also using the the cheapest generators for that one regulation, which is the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And to me, that makes sense. But I, 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 I thought that you were arguing that in stage one, we would like the program to result in uh, a prediction of sixty for P one. Sixty for P one. Yes. But it's not. It's not that I would like that. I mean, is that is that what happens in practice when I solve this optimization problem? I mean, when I solve this optimization problem, I put here ninety. 
If I put here 90, I don't get yeah. from this optimization problem 20 and 70. Yeah. What I get is 60 and 30. And if I put here 150, I don't get 50 and 100. What I get is 60 and 90. Yeah. Right? Yeah, one question was you are saying all the time that uh, the optimal solution would be the P1 because it's cheaper in layer A or like in the first stage should be uh, 50. But the way I understand it is that because you have the product that you want to uh, try to fulfill, and finally the system operator needs to fulfill this uh, forecast, your sum of P1 and P2 needs to be. That forecast, but the way that you dispatch your generators because you also have different errors that can uh, happen, and the flexibility, the cost of the flexibility, as you said, then uh, it's different. So the second generator is cheaper. What you want to optimize is kind of that dispatch. So if you want to have the sum of those both generators equal to 50, but instead of having the first generator being 50 and the second and zero. Yes, balance that out so that you have cheaper flexibility for the second stage. Right? Yeah, the thing here is that um, is that I, that I want to respect the way the problem works, and the way the problem works is that first I solve that optimization problem, and then I solve the redispatch optimization problem, and this is my two-stage decision-making problem, and it's and it's given to you as the decision maker, you know, I know, I know that I mean I have I have I have worked myself on a stochastic programming, a stochastic leading markets, robust leading markets, but that's another story. I mean, I could convince the system operator or the market operator that they should use a stochastic programming to clear the market, right? But they don't do it. What they do is that they first solve the dispatch problem in a market that is called day ahead market, and then they solve another real time market. They don't solve the both things together using optimization and uncertainty techniques. That's what Jala and I and many other people would like them to do, but they don't do it. There is no market right now in the, in the world that is using a stochastic programming to clear a market. If they were using a stochastic programming to clear the market, then you would see the phenomenon that you are, that you are uh, talking about here, that we can destroy the merit order dispatch, because if we destroy the merit order dispatch, and we just, you know, that we do what, whatever we want in the first stage, it's going to be better in the second stage. But that's not the case here. Here, we want to respect the actual status quo, the, the current status quo. And the current status quo is that they receive a forecast, with that forecast, they clear that market, they, they solve that problem, and then they wait and see to see what happens in the, in the real time. So what we are doing here is to say, okay, that is status quo, that's how you work. But if it's instead of using 50, which is the forecast that you normally use to clear that, that, uh, that problem, instead of using that, do you use this rule? I say, don't use 50. Use 90. I'm going to use 100. Use 150. Um, perhaps, I mean, most probably, you're not going to get the stochastic programming solution as if you were cleaning the market in a stochastic way. But you are getting something better than what you're doing right now. And the philosophy is the same. Instead of using a forecast, instead of using a, a number that you have made up, use another different market, another different number. Why? Because what the, the question is, why the hell they are using here the forecast? It doesn't make any sense to use the forecast. That's, that's what we actually do. Use something, it uses a different number that I'm going to tell you that is going to give you better results in the end. Okay? And that's the whole point of the contest of decision making. Okay? Knowing the context, modify it a little bit and do better decisions. But I'm not changing the status quo. I would like the status quo to change. I would like the stochastic programming to be used for clear the market and so on. But they are not. They don't want to do it right now. Okay. Okay. So still, yes. Um, it's not a general question. So actually, you're saying that you're using that the information from current time period and including your optimization problem, but then. 
then the notion behind that is that actually the, the current conceptual form uh, information tells something about the future. Exactly. So, so how how does this compare to this kind of predict and optimize where you actually would because like separate predict predict then optimize is what we did before is you predict mm -hmm. okay you introduce the prediction in the in the optimization problem and we get the results that's the forecasting approach this is this is predict then optimize okay what we are do, what we are seeing here is a smart predict then optimize or what we call also value oriented forecasting is I'm not using the forecast. I'm using the context, which can be the forecast. I'm modifying the forecast, and I'm using something else. So my smart prediction, the idea is that my smart prediction is not the forecast itself. It's something different. My smart prediction here is not 50. My smart prediction here is not 50, it's 90. And my smart prediction here is not 100. My smart prediction is 150. Okay? So that's the difference. Is that if you're going to predict, if you're going to use a forecast, use a forecast that does not necessarily represent the traditional conditional expectation of your distribution, that represents something else, that takes into account the decision value, the decision ex cost, the cost of the decision ex cost. But now, because you're seeing this Feels a bit conflicting because then we're also saying that your unbiased forecast misses information, so maybe then it's, it's not. I don't understand. So, so you're saying okay, this unbiased forecast. The, the unbiased forecast is fifty. Fifty. However, I have contextual information that um, influences my future uh, value, but you don't include it in the forecast. That's what you want, but then you're actually also saying that my current unbiased forecast means information, so it's biased. So it's no, it's, it's because here I'm using the forecast is something given by a machine learning thing. I'm using the forecast, the conditional expectation, I'm using it as a the context because it's what I know now. I could I could have told this presentation in a different way. I could have. Not only the forecast as contextual optimization, it could have also solar radiation, wind speed, and I can use other features. But to make things simple here, I'm only using the forecast as the contextual optimization, as the context. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, the forecast is uh, something fabricated by a machine learning artificial intelligence algorithm. But everything fabricated by artificial intelligence, machine learning, is also data. It's also feature, it's also contextual information. So I'm using the among all the possible contextual information that I could be using, I'm using the forecast produced by a machine learning thing or whatever. I could have explained this presentation using solar radiation, wind speed as well as the context, or temperature as it, and it's the ice cream shop example. But for explanation, because this is aligned with the papers that I have published and so on, we use the Forecast itself, we are using it as context. Which in the end is like saying, modify the forecast in such a way that the modification takes into account what the, my system costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Maybe it's stupid, but why don't I modify my forecast? Sorry? Why don't I modify the forecast? Modify yeah, that's something that I, uh, a colleague of yours uh, talked to me about. That you could do this. In, in the forecasting stage. For example, if the forecast is produced by a machine learning algorithm, I could use the I could modify the machine learning algorithm to do something similar to this. Right? To take into account the, what they call the downstream cost okay, of my problem. That's something that is done. There are many papers about that. My view, I have done it myself. My view is that simply modifying the forecast gives you the same benefits in a much, much simpler way, uh, manner. So my, from, a, from a research point of view, my argument here is that you don't need to do that because they have too, they have too many hyperparameters to tune and so on. 
What I'm saying is that modify the forecast, even in a linear way, can give you tremendous benefits. And it's much easier. Yes? No, 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 no. Here there is no strategic behavior or anything like that, because that would be another yeah. another layer of complexity. Do we have any uh, intuition how this would change? Would it still be feasible to just change the forecast somehow if I take into consideration that my generator is not in situation today? Yes. Actually, as I also was as, uh, talking to uh, with a colleague of yours, the way we implement this in practice is not like this. We use data, public data from the markets. Right? Like we have a paper about this, about how to implement this in a realistic setup. If the, da if the data of the market that you get is a market that where there is market power, somehow the way I train my algorithm, the way I train this parametric rule will take into account somehow this market power. Yes? Can you please go back a little bit to the Let's see if I can go back. Yes. Yeah, where you have A and B, where one and four is. Uh, yeah. I, I don't get it. Uh, when you solve this whole problem uh, with all the two of condition problems together. Yes. And you got A and B, one and four B. This. No. The, uh, this is if I remove this constraint. Yes. I get this one. If I plug in that constraint, I get this one. Yes, but the, the uh, expected cost for this problem was if not 825, right? And then you, uh, in one of, of the slides afterwards, you said uh, when nature is evaluating these actions, you got a higher, a much higher. A much higher, 51% 50, higher. How, was, how did that happen? And it, it happened because your mathematical program is preparing you for something being anticipative, but nature tells you you cannot anticipate the future. So you are going to pay for that. You know what I mean? I mean, when I apply this rule here, and I, I apply this rule in practice, what I get is this, not the hand. This is the actual application of the rule. The other one, this one, is what my mathematical programming, my mathematical program is telling me that I'm gonna get, which is false. What I really get is this when you apply the the rule in practice. Okay. And uh, uh, full program, uh, the full model. Uh, this one? Yes, the, the one without the last constraint. But yes. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> you have like subscript omega uh, for like different realizations, right? So shouldn't you have like different A's and B's for different realizations? That would be even worse because then it means that my parameters adapt to the future, which is something that cannot happen. You cannot have, you cannot, you cannot modify the forecast depending on the future because that's not something. In the future, you don't know the load. If you knew the future in the, uh, if you knew the load in the future, then this, this, there would be no uncertainty. So you cannot modify. Uh, the, the parameters depending on the uncertainty, because in that case, it's like you, you are a, a guest teller and you know the future perfectly, you know? Okay, so, but still, there is something weird in these results. And what is weird in these results is that they don't respect the optimization problem. They don't respect this optimization problem. They are not giving me the solution that they should be, that they should be given. If I put here, 90, I should get 60 and 30. And if I put here 150, I should put there 60 and 90, and I'm not getting that. Okay? So, there is something there weird. Now I'm going to do the same. This is what I, what I was talking about to you right now. I'm going to take the decision rule, this one, and nature is going to apply it in practice. It's going to evaluate. What does it mean? It means. I take the rule, I put the rule there, and I solve this optimization problem for every possible event that can happen in nature. Okay? I plug the rule, I solve the optimization problem, and the solution to that optimization problem comes to the real benefit. 
Once I do that for every possible event that can happen in nature, what I really get, okay, see the difference. This is what I get from the linear optimization problem, what we call the training problem or the estimation problem. This is what I get from nature, that is from the testing problem, the evaluation problem. It's like in, in, in machine learning, you have a training of the algorithm, testing of the algorithm, right? And what I get is 12, uh, 1200 euros, okay? Which is 145 euros more than computed by my training algorithm. My training is like, you know, the training versus test. It's like the previous model is overfitting my data. That would be the analogy with machine learning, okay? But still, but it's better, you see, it's two euros better than this rule. This rule, this one, is two euros better than this one. But still it's not a good rule, because it's not, it's not training properly. My mathematical problem is not training the rule properly. Okay, why is not training the rule properly? Because it's not respecting the decision process that I, wa I really want to solve. I really want to solve this problem. And this problem is a many order dispatch. Yes? I it's kind of a follow-up follow up on this question. Why do you really want the merit order dispatch? But you're proving that this is actually cheaper than not doing the merit order dispatch. No, no, no. This is no. If here there are some boundaries conditions that I have to respect because I cannot change the world. And the markets and the TSO, they want to solve that problem. Okay, so so that, are my, that are my boundaries conditions. Okay, it's not mathematical uh, because they want to do it that yeah, way. Yeah, they want to do it that way. Okay. This is, these are my boundaries conditions. You say that this is cheaper and they want to do it that Yeah, because this problem, they say, I, okay, I send this result to the TSO, to the European TSO. And they tell me, 20 and 70? But if, if P1, is much cheaper. Why 20 and the other 70? And then the economist, they say, hey, are you are you discriminating me? My, I have a lower cost. Why are you dispatching me less? And then you are the operation research. Like, no, it's because it's stochastic programming, I have a scenarios and so on. What? <laughs> my cost, my cost is much lower. Are you I mean you are discriminating me? I'm going to sue you. Right? So that's my boundaries. I have to respect that. And we have to work with that. I would like things to be different. Because they are more, I know that they, 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 can do, they can do things better, but they don't want to. They have their reasons, and there are very good reasons. They want simplicity, transparency. If I have a lower cost, I have to be dispatched first. Okay? Okay. So, the non-anticipative issue is bigger than we thought. Okay? We are not solving it at all. No, we are not solving it totally. We are just partially solving it. Why? Because we are not respecting the status quo. How do we respect the status quo? We have it here. This is what I want my mathematical programming, the mathematical programming to, uh, to do. Okay? So I'm a mathematical programmer. Just give me the constraints. I will plot the constraints in my training algorithm. I take these constraints. I plot them here. Not only I want anticipativity. I want merit order dispatch. This is my boundary condition. And what is the merit order dispatch for this very simple example? Is only generator two can be dispatched different from zero if the first cheapest generator is dispatched at full capacity. This is what this means. This greater than zero implies this equal to the capacity. Of course, this is a mathematical problem. This is properly written, but we, this cannot be solved uh, using a general purpose solver. You know that, right? I mean, this kind of constraint you cannot plug in in Python, in Iomo, in Julia, you cannot write this kind of constraint. We have to reformulate that constraint, that implication. It's not linear. It's not linear. It's not linear. 
No, don't worry. I mean, it's much better. You probably the answer thinks this is well, but this is because that solution is very simple. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. In the, in the papers that I'm going to show you in the end, we do it for a more general progress and so on. This is this is for for us to do it in in three hours, and hopefully we will not be able to finish it. But I mean, that's the reason. Okay. So let's. This is a non-linear constraint, and we have to reformulate it in a way that can be processed by solvers. Okay, but this is actually what we want to do. This is the, the key point here. We want my training algorithm to respect the merit order dispatch. This is the general approach. The general approach is compute A and B, compute A and B in such a way that you make sure that the merit order dispatch and the non-anticipativity is satisfied. This is how we would write it. This is a binary program. So you can see that when we want to do things in a contextual way, the mathematical program is not a convex optimization problem like they do, they do in forecasting that they maximize the likelihood, the likelihood or the minimize the square error. It's something much more complicated. It's where operation research comes into state. Okay? So, but we cannot write this. We have to transform into a single level problem. In our case, in this toy example, this is very simple to do. We know what that problem does, so we can do it like this. This is, these are the optimality conditions of the lower level problem, which are very simple to understand in our case. They are doing this. I introduce a binary variable. This is a binary variable that tells me if the binary variable is equal to one, you see here, P1 has to be at maximum capacity. And then in that case, P2 can be whatever they want. But if the binary variable is equal to zero, then this guy here can be whatever it wants, the cheapest one, but this one has to be zero. Cannot be dispatched. This is doing exactly this is doing exactly this. Okay? So now we have our problem, our training algorithm in a way that can be processed by a, a solver. In this case, we would need a milk solver because this becomes a mixed integer problem. The other ones were linear optimization problems, but they were wrong. Okay? We do this and we get a third rule. We get a third rule, which is 2.6 LF minus. We get this. This is the third rule. And this is hopefully already doing what we want it to do because we have implemented the we have embedded the two state decision progress in our training hour. Okay? So we get the rule and we get the same table. But now you can see the rule. If the forecast is 50, if the context is 50. 50 multiplied by 2.6 is 120, no, 130, minus 110 is equal to 20. And then we get 20, zero. All the way, the first three scenarios. If my contest is 100, then this is 260 minus 110 is 150. 150, and then we get 60, 90. You see, the merit order is respected. And what we get is 160 and 75. And this is exactly what we get from the milk and from nature. So now the training and the test is exactly the same. The same. And we are saving, for this very simple sample, 10% of the cost. So we are making a difference now. The rule is very good. It's saving 10% of the rule, 10% of the cost. Okay? Agree? Okay. So now let's rewind. Yes? Was the expected cost now lower than the training for the previous From the training? Yeah. 
Or was it just lower in... No, you see, for the previous one, the second one, for example, the second one is what, 155? But then the real one is 1200. Yes. So in, in the in decision theory, we say that this guy here was very optimistic. Yeah. Okay? And this one here is exactly as optimistic as one can be, or as pessimistic as one, as one should be, because the train is equal to the, to the test. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea we have to do this in, in a real scenario is that the parameters of the should change from time to time. Okay, yeah. Maybe with online learning, for example. Yeah. We can use online learning to compute this A and B on a real time basis mm -hmm. so, so that we take into account all the, all the dynamics of my system. Okay. okay, here they are static because it's a toy example yeah. and things under control and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay? I have a bit of a philosophical question. So you said that they introduced this rule to sell it to the TSO because they don't believe in this fantastic programming of the nature. Exactly. This, this doesn't jeopardize their status quo. I agree, but for me as a TSO to apply this rule, I kind of still have to believe in all of this, in the scenarios. In the mm, well, no. Yeah, I mean, they say a TS, the TSO, they can get, they can get uh, the, the forecast on a provider. So you just quit silent. You say, I'm going to, this is my forecast. I'm going to modify it like this. And you, did, you, let, you, you give them another number. And they don't have to find out. And actually, <laughs> and, but the, the reality, no, that's a that's a joke. But the reality is that they do they are doing it. If you go to California TSO to PGM in their manuals, they are doing this, but based on experience. What they do actually is that they have a very low, high wind power production. They say, hey, don't chase the risk because I know I can I can I can have a lack of downward uh, of, of upward reserve. What they do is that they um, they bias the forecast downward, and this is written in their manuals. Mm. When they when they see that there is a there is a the, the dark curve, you know, for example, they don't they don't plug into their optimization algorithms. They don't plug the forecast, the real forecast. They they bias it because they want to have an excess of production just in case something is wrong. So what I'm claiming is that they are already doing this, but they are not doing it with the proper tools. You know? So it's it's better to keep the optimization problem or the clearing problem simple and maybe have a bit of transparency. Exactly, something like that. I mean, it's not the same using a scenarios in a stochastic programming way that saying I'm going to modify the forecast a little bit mm -hmm. because it's something that they already do and they they do it for security reasons. Well, then, then the expert here is probably Galal. <laughs> How to solve by level by level problems and so on. There are techniques to solve them. Um, we have actual. You will see a, a paper where we 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 solve this in a general way using a by level program, and we provide their techniques to do it to do it. Of course, if the problem is too complex, then you would have to resources to some approximation or something like that. But there are techniques. There is a whole bank, There is a whole community on on researchers about how to solve bilateral problems in an efficient way. It's related to combinatorial optimization. Um, you mentioned that in like, for example, in California, where the books have the rules written. I don't see where optimization comes in any, in any of this, because what we're essentially doing is, oh, there's, okay, yeah, we're optimizing A and B, but they, like you could again do it based on experience, 
And then this is just rule based, right? You're just arranging the dispatchers in ascending order of price and then dispatching based on whatever your modified forecast is. I don't see how this is more, how is this an optimization based approach is my question. I mean, it's an optimization, it's it's an optimization based, based approach, approach in, 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 in so much as you are computing the optimal modification of the forecast okay. while they are doing it with a rule of thumb. They have a guy there or a, and saying, okay, now we have a lot of wind. Oh, just uh, um, consider a lower forecast so that there is not so much capacity committed in the day ahead, and then we can have more capacity in case that something fails. And then the problem of that is that they have to spill wind, or they, they, cannot, they do it a lot in Spain, for example. In Spain, because uh, whenever there is a, an amount of wind power production in the system that goes beyond the regular levels, they say, hey, no, let's spill, a, let's spill a little bit of wind because just in case. So this is, you know, it's like uh, you are doing it properly. Sure, yes, I, I agree. But there's also, like, there is also value in embedding past information, right? Which is, essentially, that is data-based approach. Yeah, but this is more of a, no, no, but I, no, I don't get past it all. Like I don't want to get you confused because of the simplicity of the optimization problem. The way this is implemented in reality is with past data. Okay, so this is a, this is like machine learning, but it's machine learning decision based. In, it's a machine learning aiming for decision value, no machine learning aiming for a statistical parameter like a forecast. Yeah. But the way this is implemented is with, is with real data, and so if I have time, I will go through. Decided by the past data. Exactly, this is decided by the past data. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that, mm -hmm. and we are heading there. Okay, so now let's rewind because I want to show another approach. I'm going to be quick in this time because this is not the, the approach that I'm going to show here is very popular as well, but I don't like it. So um, I'm going to go here a little bit faster. There is another approach that is very well known as well, and it was one of the first approaches that were um, uh, proposed. Okay, one possible thing is. Let's forget about the dispatch, the, about the optimization problem. I mean, I don't want to break the status quo, so I have to respect this solution. But I don't want to embed that optimization problem in a bilevel programming fashion, like I did before. So what I'm going to do is to replace. It's going, I'm going to make the decisions using rules. So look the difference. Now is the decision itself, themselves, what are linear affine functions? There are affine functions of the context, of the forecast. This is a decision rule based approach, and probably you have heard it, where you are making decisions on the way with rules, with a machine learning, whatever, no linear rules, something like that. Okay? The other, the parametric rule, is estimating a parameter of my optimization problem, in this case, the load. Okay? Here I'm estimating the decision themselves. The decision of the optimization problem. And I did the same. I compute this. When I compute this with a training algorithm, I compute P1 and P2, and then I see what happens in the real time. That's another approach. Okay, again, how do we compute the root coefficient? Exactly the same as before, but with this, with this switch. Okay? We solve exactly the same problem as before. But now I have decision rules for P1 and P2. So I'm computing the A and Bs of my decision rule. I have two because I have two decision variables. Okay? So I have this decision rule for P1, this decision rule for P2, and I'm computing A and B for each of the generator, right? In the same way as before. And this constraint here, as you remember, these are the merit order constraints because, and the non occupativity constraints because we are aiming at the same thing. Okay? I do, I do this and I get these parameters. Okay? Then this is the same table. C, and this is the key point here. C, these are the decision rules. This is what we get from the previous meal and from the two-state process, I mean, from nature. And it gets exactly the same. 
as the parametric proof. 1075. The same as before. So my question is to you is is this was this to be expected that we get the same thing? For us for such a small example? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if we add these two variables, right, it's like having a, a parametric rule here. That's what intuition tells us, right? Any other comment? That's totally logical. If you add 0.8 and 1.8, then you get 2.6. If you add 0.9, you get 1.8, right? So, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's basically what we were saying. Yeah. Okay. You sum it to the thing and you get a C. Yeah. Well, I, I said that I don't like this approach. I'm not uh, uh, an advocate of this approach, and I, I'm going to explain to you why. Okay, this is the decision rule. This is a modification, a, a tiny, tiny modification of my reality. Okay? What I have done is to add two scenarios two extra scenarios. I have the same as before, here, the same as before, here, okay, and two extra scenarios with, with a different context. Now we have three contexts, 50, 85, and 100. And I have done it, I mean, I'm not tricking you, I have done it in such a way that these two scenarios are, the, the, the forecast is an unbiased forecast of the two scenarios. This has the same probability, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 conditional probabilities, and the mean of these two is 85. Okay, and then I have modified the other probability so that everything is aligned, everything is unbiased, and so on, not to trick you, okay? And this is the expected cost that we get. We, these are the, the decision rules that we get. With this lead tiny modification of reality, okay? And this is the parametric rule. So that's the decision rule. This is the parametric rule. Observe that after having modified a little bit the reality, the joint distribution, the parametric rule doesn't change. But the decision rule has changed. And you see that the parametric rule is almost 6% small. Okay, so it's better to use the parametric rule. Do you have a, a plausible explanation? It has a it has a very very nice optimization based explanation, and that's why I think decision rules are not appropriate to deal with optimization with decision of optimization problems. So the only thing that I have done is to include an additional context. Before we had two contexts, 50 and 100, now we have three contexts. 50, 85, and 100. This is what happens. The first thing that you can see is that all the, the decision rule for the second generator is A2 equal to 0, B2 equal to 0. So it's telling us that every time for every possible context, I shouldn't dispatch at all the generator 2. Why is that? Because the decision rule must satisfy this constraint, which we know very well already. P2, that is the decision rule of P2, can only be strictly greater than 0 if, I mean, if this is greater than 0, then this decision rule, which is P1, has to be at maximum capacity. And this must be satisfied for every possible value of the context. For every possible value of LF, this can only be greater than zero. The result of the decision rule for P2 can only be greater than zero if the result of the first decision rule is at maximum capacity. 
And for those of you who are very familiar with optimization, this every possible value of LF is something very constrained. In the previous problem, we had only two contexts. So we were saying in the previous we were saying that A2 for the first context 50 uh, plus B2 greater than 0 implies A1 50 plus B2 equal to P1 capacity is that this? Yes, A1 here and B1 here. Okay? And for the other context, add A2 to 100 plus B2 greater than 0 implies A2 50, A1 50 plus B1 equal to this. These are two constraints. If I add another problem, another context, A3, 85, plus B3 greater than 0 implies A1, 85, plus B1 equal to this. You know where I want to go? Every time that we add a new context, the decision rules becomes more and more and more constrained. In an in a, in a analogy with machine learning, we are getting a family of parametric rules that are more, that are becoming smaller, 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 smaller. The, the representative capacity of my decision rule is diminished. Okay? And every, in reality, every, for all the context, means an infinite number of constraints when we are dealing with continuous distributions in reality. So, it's a constraint that has to be satisfied for every possible context. And if the context is continuous, it's an infinite number of constraints. So the capacity, the representative capacity of decision rules is very, very low. Okay? And that doesn't happen to the parametric rule. The parametric rule is not affected by that. Okay? Yes? The, on the second one, it should be A1 to 100 as well. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So we should. Yes. So, of, of course, when we only have two, you see, yeah, when we only have these two, we have four degrees of freedom to satisfy those constraints. But when we have three, we have the same, the, we have, uh, this is one, this is two, two. For when we have three, we have the same four degrees of freedom for three constraints. If we have another constant, we are increasing the number of constraints while maintaining the same number of parameters. So it's becoming shrinking, 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 shrinking. Okay? So we lose the predictive performance of the decision rule. Okay? So that's why as we add more constraints, the decision rule is going to worsen and worsen and worsen. Decision rules only make sense when your problem is not constrained, when you're solving an, optimis an unconstrained optimization problem. Okay? The moment your optimization problem is very constrained, they are going to lose the power. Okay. And this is what I said, that the parametric rule is not affected by that, this other approach. Okay, of course, the, pay, the, the, the here, what well, you have to call it, the other case as well. Okay, so far so good. Now we are going to enter a little bit into, into practice um, about these scenarios and so on. This is what, this is nature. And nature, we sometimes, for these optimization problems, we were using the fact that we know reality, right? But then, caution, we have to we have to be caution and we have to be careful because this is not the case. We don't know reality. What we know exactly. So this is unknown. What do we have in reality? 
what we have in reality is, is data, right? So we have realizations of that truth. So what we have in reality is data, a sample of the joint distribution. That's what we really observe. And always it will be a noisy data sample. So we don't have a tree. What we have in reality is this one sample, which is, uh, this sample is related to, you know, 50, 90. So we got 50, 0.5, 91.2. So these are noisy observations. So in this case, we have sampled five noisy observations of the previous tree. We also have 104 of the 100, 116.5. And this is what we really need, what we, what we really have when we apply this in practice. We don't have the tree, we have the data. So what, we do, what do we do in this case? No problem. As material learning does, we rely on data. So we solve the same problem as before, but with my data. What we call the empirical risk minimization problem adapted to operation research. Again, empirical risk minimization adapted to contextual optimization. Instead of having, instead of having the scenarios, the actual scenarios that are only known by nature, we solve the problem with the actual data, which is what a human being actually has, with the observations. So I can pose my problem in the same way, but using the data. And the data, we assume the empirical distribution of the data, and the, the data is weighted by 1 over n, where n is the size of my data. So I have 1,000 data observations from the past. I plug into my problem this 100 observation of the track, and this is what they call training algorithm. This is training my model. But it's, training is not a, this is not an artificial neural network. This is not a support vector machine. This is an optimization problem being trained to make the decision that we want to have. Okay? And the same applies to the training of the decision rules. Exactly the same. Okay? So it's a machine learning that in their guts, it has the problem that we want to solve. Okay, so we train and we get these parameters. We solve this problem. We solve this problem for the decision rule and for the parameter rule. And of course, reality is much more difficult, much more complex, and see what we get. This is the training phase with my data. We get this decision rule. Of course, the decision rule is very, very bad because it cannot handle constrained problems. It cannot handle the merit of the rule. It's very difficult to find four parameters in such a way that for every possible context, we are getting the merit of the rule. Okay, so the best he can, uh, the best it can do is to put one of the one of the one of the um, units, the costly one, to zero. In that case, I don't have problems with the meritor rule. Okay, and this is the parametric rule, and this is the estimated expected cost. What is the estimated expected cost? Is the training cost? Okay, but you get like the like the. The in sample root mean square error in machine learning here is the training decision cost. Okay, what happens in the evaluation test? What happens when nature comes with the tree that we saw before with the real joint distribution of my data and evaluates what I have done? Well, it happens that my cost, my actual expected cost, skyrockets. Okay, in they increase a lot, as you can see. You see, if you compare. So the estimations are really bad, the training costs are really bad. Which is something that, ma that makes sense because we have very few data, we have only five data. If, we have, if, if I had 1,000 data, maybe would, this would work much, much better. I mean, I can promise you that it, it will work much better. But one key message here, an important message in the operation research literature, which is quite known and we have to have in mind, see the actual expected cost of the classical forecasting approach. The actual expected cost of the, of the classical forecasting approach using the forecast, the one that you, you suggested in the first place, 
is much lower. Why is that? Because you're not relying on non submission. Exactly. The classical forecasting approach, I mean, here I am sampling the joint distribution. So I know the forecast. So the forecast doesn't rely on the data. I mean, the, 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 what I mean is it doesn't rely on the data, it relies on the data to get the forecast. But here we, we're assuming that the guy that is providing me with the forecast has data and, and has become, uh, has, has given me the best forecast, okay? I'm talking about the data of the joint distribution. It's a, that's, it's a very important difference, okay? But the forecast approach doesn't rely on the joint distribution data. This makes the forecasting approach, and this is proven by some people, a robust approach. When you are in, when you are in lack of data, the, the classical forecast tends to be robust. And this, is, this is small example is already showing us that point, okay? These ones depend on the joint distribution data, on the joint samples, we say the joint samples. So if we have very few joint samples, they are too optimistic. Okay. Is it the mean of the sample and it's still creepy? No, no, because this, the, uh, that's why here I'm, I'm playing around with the joint samples. Okay. So um, the guy, the provider, sorry, how this works in practice? The provider is giving me 50.1, right, of the forecast. And then I see what happens in reality. The provider gives me mm, 100. 101 of the forecast, and then I get 140 of the load, right? I don't need to have to say, okay, my data, my data is fulfilling with the mean. In, if I have an infinite number of data points from the joint distribution, should they should coincide, but I only have five. Do you have that access to selected cost No, but the, I, here, here I don't have it. Yeah, here it doesn't, it doesn't comply with because I only have five data. If I have one million of data, it will, it will, they will match. Yeah, but your, your, the, the one calculation now are, are worse because you're using those five data. Yes, so only those five data. Yeah, it would be interesting to compare it if you use those five data along with the interest value, the empirical mean, so that if the value, the last value you put was computed with the empirical mean instead of the Ah, you mean the, the, yeah, but, but I'm relying on the forecast. I'm relying on the provider of the forecast, so I, I plug the forecast. I plug uh, the 50.05 directly because I supposedly it's a very good forecaster. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to have a small break? If there is this, this last part. Let's have a small break, and then we will do this last part. Because I think, yes. You are buying the 
you don't have the money behind you. You are just buying for the money behind you. That's so the product is free, right? Uh, I need to pay for 760 years old. We can just go back here. <laughs> You are treating, you are treating the forecast a little bit. Here is an example that normally is not different, but depending on this or this. So that you are gaining economics. You are gaining economics. You are not. You are not. You are not a producer. You are not a company that you can do whatever you want. Yeah, no, no, no. Here you are buying by the market. In the European market, they don't take into account the real time estate when they are they are uh, treating the the they are not. They don't. Of course. They don't. They don't take that into account. Yeah. 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 Because, because I'm relying on the five samples, and the five samples only, they are telling me that the forecast is not good. You know, it's a matter of the five samples. So maybe the forecast is really good, so if you need the forecast, it's really good. But since, since I'm trying to rely on the samples, the samples are telling me that you have to do something else, but the samples are wrong because they have only five samples. Probably is not a good decision to rely on something. You know, data driven data driven methods depend a lot on the amount of data you have. You have to data data scarcity, and then your data driven methods are not machinery in the world to produce the best but the, the problem is that they, the best forecast they have produced is not aligned with the optimization. So the, the best forecast that you have from the app of the load doesn't see whether they are using the load for economic research, for trading in the market, for trade discussion, you know, that's the thing. So, um, and here I'm using the best forecast in the case of because the best forecast is the one that perfectly matches the condition of expectations. That's, the, that's what the, every forecast is. Exactly. You could, you could, for example, you could put balance there. You can also use as as context moments of your visit. Yeah, everything, or or even day of the week. Or maybe you can use uh, day of the week. Uh, you can do whatever. I mean, it's the the basis that you may or fit your model. Related to that question, for example, when I read the model. I use also like number of forecasts, or I can just show it as a Yeah, you can, instead of using it as a context, the forecast, 
you can use the load in the PQ shower. If I'm treating in the market, I can use the that that out the previous week. Exactly. You my model, and then I I get the perfect forecast, and I try to put my optimum bidding. Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, here we are using the contract forecast, and you can use whatever you might think is has to be too far. Okay. So and yeah, I want to make sure that I tune the model in the correct direction. Yes. Something that you can. I mean, I was trying to give some statistics in the vision, but I think it's a scenario where I'm going to be. Ah, the classical. Yes, I never thought about it. But the the good thing about this is that, as I said, it doesn't break the status quo. You know, it doesn't break. I, I don't need to go even the statistics and make sure that my scenarios are you know, as we do. You can use that in your group. That's what it is. That's why it is called that kind of optimization because it relies on the past data or every data that you have. You don't have to create probabilistic models. And, and just once I tune my model, I just put the perfect forecast and I get my perfect model. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. I mean, okay, so if I need to excel, I would say that I thought that it could be pretty plenty. I, I, I would have to find a, a possible explanation. I was looking at the other bit of the bar, so there were a few different scenarios. And I mean, maybe this one is worth it. I could have a good one. Because we are closer to the yeah, that's that's a continue that you can say. If you if you want to sell that to a DSO, see that way oh yeah, my forecast is fifty, but I see that you should put twenty. And then they are gonna sell it. I think that this 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 is more on the trading point of view. More on the well it's more like a this is a very total so normally you don't you won't have so much difference. This is I mean not important the number to the value of the number that is here because of course it's exactly that. Yeah. If you notice this example one is way worse in terms of the balance of the system yes. rather than the other one. So I assume that on this case we consider on the trading side and we don't consider the balance of the system at all. Yeah, but I mean this system is always balanced. The, the thing is that what is not are you what is not balanced is these two numbers with the forecast. But why do you have why the question, the argument is why you have to balance your dispatch with the forecast? Because I assume the forecast is good. Yes. I assume that it's good. You assume that it's good, but it's not the, the it's not that good to your system. It's not the truth. So I it's I not the and it's not like it's not the truth. Is that given the characteristic of your system? Balancing with respect to the might forecast be, might not be a good practice. So this is something that you that you use the day before, the week before, on the day ahead market. Yeah, when you get closer to each hour. Yeah, the, of course. The well, it's still, it's still my answer would be no. You get closer to the real time. You have you, a more precise maybe, maybe forecast. Have, yeah, you have more precise forecast, but maybe it's still the forecast is not the best thing to balance. Okay. I can guarantee you that. I know that. It, what I, should they consider in that case? Imagine that, for example, that mm -hmm. that you have very, very, very cheap downward regulation units. Okay. Like you have very fast downward regulators with, yes. with a cost of zero. Okay. What I would do is to put all the generators up. Okay. Even if my forecast is telling me that you should put twenty, I would say put fifty. Why? Because if, I, if then I get more renewals, I have very fast generators that are going to click quickly. But for what concerns this, uh, in the Italian case, I spoke to several renewables energy distributor resources owners and they told me, okay, we have this power plant and uh, we pay more in unbalances fees rather than our clear incomes. So 
think, especially in Italy, it's very important the unbalanced side. So I cannot say, it, okay, I put this, and in this case, I'm ready. But, 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 um, but your imbalance can be. Yeah, I mean, in that case, if, if, if your objective is to minimize the imbalance. It's not the, the objective to minimize the imbalance, it's that if there is an imbalance, I have to pay for it. Yeah, but that's because of the Italian system. Regulation, because like we pay for the imbalances. The imbalances. You, fee, you pay to the generators. The, for example, if they have an owner of a power plant, you usually ask for a, a controller to control the power plant. It's called uh, GSA. Mm -hmm. And then the G, GMA is the market. The GSC controls the, the power plant and try to be as precise as possible. Of course, it, it's not a perfect precise. And so when we are at the H hour and we have to provide the energy, the GSC computes the difference between the actual power and the real power. And then in that case, it's because your, your optimization problem, the, the decision that you want to make is to minimize the impact. If your objective is to minimize the impact because you have to pay for the impact somehow, then your, your costs are symmetric, and then the best you can do is the conditional, is the forecast. Uh, the classic forecast? The classical. You know why? Because it's like you have, the, the, the here is because we have different costs, right? Mm -hmm. But if your objective function is to minimize the imbalance, no matter the cost, then your, your objective function is symmetric. And if your objective function is symmetric, the best you can do is the forecast. Okay, so basically, in the Italian mm -hmm. case, the this algorithm is different. I think that this algorithm is very useful for the data exactly. market, not if for the you, when you take into account the bits, the the cost. Okay, okay. Because then your 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 objective function is asymmetric. Maybe this is like this, and this part is, you know, is 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 a is asymmetric. If you have a asymmetric objective function, the best you can do is the. Okay. Thank the, you very much. No, no, no. Ah, because you were already in the place. Porque yo estoy calculando la visión de él, como tú sabes, estoy utilizando la red real para la evaluación. Y la evaluación sobre el test es el área. Sí. Y la realidad es el área. Ya, pero tú estabas hablando de la realidad. No, lo que estoy teniendo es que tiene la A y la B. ¿Cómo va? 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 Pero entonces la realidad uso el podcast o no? Porque si el podcast sale más corta. Claro, eso es lo que yo quiero ver. ¿Qué ocurre si yo tengo la de entrenador y me tiene que salir mejor? Y el podcast, ¿eh? Vas a ir con esto, ¿eh? Es que lo mejor que puedes hacer es lo que hemos hecho, ¿no? Porque antes estaba yo entrenando en su edad. Claro, claro. Si yo entreno en su edad, la que iba a ir a tener un millón de pasajes, ¿no? Pero vas a ir a tener un millón de pasajes, ¿no? Pero si en lugar de dar los tres o cinco postas de ese año, te lo vas a ir, ¿no? Ah, claro. Ya, ya, ya. Por eso, ah, salí en 1075, ¿no? Claro, claro, entonces, pero cuando ya no tengo el árbol para entrenar, porque el árbol no lo conozco, solo lo conozco en la entrevista. Ya, ya, ya. Ya, pues, entonces, pues, 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 además, ahora, si tuviera el primer equipo de una espada de ese árbol, mira, mi niña de una espada de ese árbol, pues, además, pues, salí en el árbol, y continuaré con el equipo, ¿no? 1075. 1075. Claro, claro. Sí, pero es que tienes más tiempo. Sí, pero es que tienes más tiempo. Sí, pero es que Yes, yes. 
Les producteurs, oui, ils ont profité de la situation. Après, les producteurs, ils sont pas Okay, so we have very little time left, but I would like I would like to mention the last family of approaches because all the approaches that we have seen so far are parametric. Like in machine learning, you have parametric approaches, for example, linear regression, polynomial regression, that are parametric approaches. But in the forecasting machine learning literature, you also have non-parametric approaches that they don't parameterize your rules, your family of what they call hypothesis in terms of uh, parameters. Like, let's see what I, what I want. Let's see a little bit what I, what I mean, what I mean by this. Okay, so this is this is the reality. This is the the distribution, the J distribution from which I sampled before the five sample that you saw. Noise, noise. So the question that we should pose here is that given this three, what is what is the best that we can do? And the best that we can do is not necessarily the parametric rule, the decision rule that we have seen before. If we know that tree, which we don't, but nature knows, or God knows, what is the best that we can do to make our decision? We can use what we call a non-parametric approach. What, we, what do we mean by that? Okay, suppose that I receive the context, and the context is 50. Since I know the tree, since I know the tree, if I receive a context of 50, right, then I know these are my possible realizations because I am God and I know the tree. Then what I can do simply is to solve this optimization problem here. I take these scenarios with their respective probabilities and I solve some sort of a stochastic program problem with three scenarios, scenarios one, two, and three. All the constraints have to be satisfied for the three scenarios. I have here my merit order constraint, my non antipativity constraints, and then I'm going to compute. For this context, I'm going to compute P1 and P2. Okay? This is non-parametric because I have not I have not inserted here any parameters. There is no A and B. Right? Okay. And this is what I get. P star 20 and 0 with an expected estimated cost of 730. If I receive the context and my context is 100, then the decision maker solved this problem. Now it's the same problem as before, but now with the scenarios 4, 5, and 6. Okay? 
And then I compute P1 and P2 that are the best for these three scenarios. Then for a context of 100, the best I can do is this, 60 and 90, with an estimated expected cost of 1 on 1,420. Again, this is not parametric, there is no A and B, okay? If we do the average, because the probability of the two contests is equal, 0 0.5, that's what is in the tree. In this we here, you have 0 0.5 for the two, okay? We take the average and we get 175. This is the best we can do. This is the perfect, perfect method. It's a non-parametric method. Of course, it's based on the unrealistic assumption that we know the tree. We know the tree, the joint distribution relating the context and the actual load, okay? Which is basic, by the way, is the same objective function that we can get with the parametric rule, with the other approach, if we know the joint distribution. We say if under perfect information, under perfect knowledge of joint distribution. Okay, but again, in reality, we only have access not to the joint distribution that is unknown, but we only have access to a sample from that joint distribution. Again, the same as before. We have these five samples from the joint distribution. Okay, so what can we do in this case that is non-parametric, there is no A and B, that resembles what we have done so far, that we um, that we sample this approach, but that only relies on data, on the joint sample data. What can we do? Do you know any non-parametric approach in machine learning? The most famous one, probably. The decision trees is a one popular one, and we can apply decision trees here. But. Uh, Sorry? Regression. Regression is parametric because uh, regre linear regression is parametric, depends on parameters. Right? <laughs> depends on a family of this we say depends on a parameterized family of functions. Non-parametric, the the most popular one that everybody uses. Clustering, Clustering is an unsupervised technique. <laughs> it could be, but that's a little bit more sophisticated. There is one that is so easy to use. Can nearest neighbors. neighbors? Who doesn't know nearest neighbors approach? Do you know nearest neighbor? I'm going to explain to you right now. Nearest neighbor is probably the most famous non-parametric approach because of its simplicity and because it normally works really well. If you have a, a lot of data, we call it that it's a data hungry method. But if you have the, the data, can nearest neighbor is a it's, a, it's very good. So we are, we are going to apply here Kanye's neighbor. Kanye's neighbor, what is the idea? Is that I have a sample, which is a joint sample of the context and the load. I receive the context, and I compute the nearest neighbors to those contexts from my data samples. And then I pick up those nearest neighbors, and I solve my problem. So for example, let's, let's choose k equal to 2. K equal to 2 is reasonable, very reasonable because we have five data samples. Okay, so K equal to 2 is probably the best here. K equal to 2. Now, we repeat the same process. If the contact is 50, how nearest neighbor of works? It's non-parametric because there is no A and B. Okay, there is, there is not a parameterized family of function. We take our data samples and we pick up the nearest neighbors. What are the nearest neighbors to 50? are 50, 0 0.5, the distance is 0 0.05, right? And 50.1, the distance is 0 0.1. Do you understand the distance, right? Yes? Well, here it's, 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 we don't care about that because all norms are equivalent because we only have one feature which is the load forecast, so the one norm, the Euclidean norm, or whatever, they are going to give you the same thing, right? In the real line, our norms are equivalent. So here I'm just checking, it's the absolute value. So we have 50, 
the distance to the first one is 0 0.05, the distance to the second one is 0 0.2, the distance to the third one is 0 0.1, and the distance to the other is 50 something. Right? So the closest neighbors to 50 are sample 1 and sample 3. Okay? Then I plug these samples here in my optimization problem. You can see it. 1 and 3, these are the closest samples. And nearest neighbors, it put a weight 1 divided by k on its samples. It's called the empirical weight, right? So if I, if I have selected the two nearest neighbors, the weights to my samples are 1 divided by k, 1 half in that case, because I have only two samples. This is exactly is the same structure as we see as we saw before with the tree. It's the same, but working with the data, not working with the gel distribution that I don't know. That only God knows. Okay. Why do we even give the distance to fifty? I mean, because the context. No, the the context. We have access to the context. This is given. In the ice cream shop example, this is the temperature at 10 a.m. And this is something that I'm measuring right now. This is my content, the content is given. I have been provided with a forecast of 50. Then I go to my data, and what are the two nearest neighbors to this 50? The one and three. And I resolve, I solve my optimization problem. This is non-parametric, again, there is no A and B. It, it, it was the same. You have a continuous probability, a continuous probability distribution. Imagine that 50 would be 50, 0 point, or 51. It's the same. You, you compute the nearest, uh, the distance. But then, for example, if you have 100 different contacts, you're not going to Well, but the, the contest, for example, if, if this is for the AI, for the AI, you will see one contest per day. It depends on the. So the contest is. It depends on the framework of your problem. So if it's easy for day ahead and then real time, then each day you receive forecasts. And then you do this every day. Okay? Okay, so we solve this problem as before, and we get this optimi these optimization variables. We get P1, P2, like this. This is the estimated expected cost, the training cost. This is what the, this optimization problem is given to me. Okay, but then when I even when nature, when God takes the tree, the reality, and evaluate the test of those decisions, the actual expected cost is 980. We say, we say in decision making under uncertainty, we say that there is disappointment. Why? Because I was expecting 945, and reality gives me. 180. There is 35 of disappointment. Okay? And my method is being more optimistic than uh, reality. Okay? I'm being too optimistic. Now, suppose that the contrast is 100. We do the same. We pick up the two nearest neighbors. We pick up these two, which are the closest. If you do the computation, uh, uh, these are the two. Then I solve the same problem, but with the two samples, four and five. Okay, I solve this problem, and this is the optimization variables that I get. <coughs> Again, estimating expected cost, 1,000, around 1,000. Actual expected cost on the real joint distribution, on the real tree, almost 1,600. There is a huge disappointment, which is kind of expected, because nearest neighbors, uh, this is the, the average of the two situations, okay? Which is a lot. And this is to be expected because near neighbor is a very, very, very powerful non-parametric approach, but it's data hungry. What do we mean by data hungry? Nearest neighbor only works if you have a lot of data. Where you have, you, we say that you have a high dense density of data. Yes? So if you do have a lot of data, um, that optimizes, and your k is higher. Yes, your k has to follow some rule. Okay. 
Okay, so in that case, your optimization wouldn't it just blow up, you know, the optimization problem, because then let's say, okay, is a thousand for if you have a Yeah, that's problem. that's one problem of nearest neighbor. That's then the, you have all these constraints for every every data object that you add. Yeah, but that, I can ask I can ask you the same question to you. You got, you you were relying yesterday on a scenario, right? So so we have the same problem here. So the same issue here is that exactly. More exactly. But there are there are things that you can do, and we are going to just sketch what you can do in that case, if I have time. But there are things that you can do. Okay. Uh, so it's a data hungry method, and this is probably us asking your, uh, answering your question. When you have a data hungry method that relates so much on data, it tends to be over optimistic and give you disappointment in the end, right? So how do we avoid this? Robustify. And I'm going to present you here a very, very, very simple um, robustifying method for KM that I have not seen in the literature, but it's very effective, okay? And since Lesia introduced you to the, uh, something, something to something much more sophisticated, which is distribution and robust optimization, you should be able to understand what I'm going to say to, to do now. Okay, what is the idea? Which is a very simple idea. I have a context of 50, and we are almost done. We have a context of 50, k is equal to 2. What is the problem of nearest neighbors? Is that I'm going to stick to the closest samples, which, which are this one, this one here, and this one here. But look, these two has an actual load associated of 91 and 93, right? But what happens? This one is also kind of close, right? It's very close to the context as well, but we have discarded because our k is equal to 2, right? But you see, the load is totally different. It's 19. So it's telling me, the third neighbor is telling me that something drastic can, can, can happen with my load. Okay? So the idea is that let's introduce ambiguity. We know the concept of ambiguity because you know now the uh, distribution of optimization on what we understand by close. Let's introduce an ambiguous concept of closeness. And what is it? This is the rules to fake KM. Don't be afraid. This is much, much simpler than what Lesia explained the other day. Okay? But um, the essential idea, very quickly, I mean, I need to explain this in detail because my idea was to learn this for exercise. But the essential idea is that. This is my context. And these are my five samples. Okay? This is the context, and this is load. The actual load. What is the idea? Can the traditional k nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors. I stick to this point. And these two points with one half, one half. But uh, what about, to, to be more representative, what about this one? This is also close, right? So what I'm going to say is, I'm going to make the probabilities of my nearest neighbors ambiguous. It means that I'm not going to decide beforehand how much weight I put on this data. I will leave my optimization problem to decide how much weight I have to put on each of the nearest neighbors. Okay? And what is the constraint that is going to impose in exchange? I'm going to say, the farther away you are from the context, the lower the weight you can have. So, if this data point is too far away from the context, I cannot give you one half. I can give you, I have to give you something low. Because the farther away from the context, the less representative you are. Okay? But this one, which is very close, it deserves a higher weight. 
it may deserve a high grade. Who does that? This constraint here, which is similar, is an empirical version of the bus stay distance. It's much easier than the bus stay distance, distance actually. This problem is very easy and you should be able to reformulate it. This is a linear programming problem. Alpha i is the weight that I sign to, the net, to, the, to my data points. So these are the probabilities that I assign to my data points. Since they are probability, they have to sum up to one. Each of them is upper binding by one divided by k. What does it mean that? It means that at least you have to pick up two points. At least you have to pick two nearest neighbors. Okay? But then the way you pick up your nearest neighbor is this one, is like this. Is that the farther, this is a budget constraint, this is the budget constraint, like a bar system is some budget constraint, okay, that is telling me, you decide a budget, and then if you are very farther away from the context, your alpha has to be lower so that we can satisfy the budget that you have, the budget of a bit. Okay, so if you are very close to the context, this absolute value will be almost zero, and the alpha i could be one over k. Of course, the two closest neighbors will be able, you can have higher values of the alphas for those. But if there is another third neighbor that is very close, it can also have a higher alpha i. Okay, so this is taking into account, for example, that I can have one third, one third, and one third for this. But also, not only that, it can be one six, uh, one six, or <coughs> one third, and here, one six, and then another one third here. For example, it could be something like that as well. Okay, depending on the distance. So it's a way to say, hey, don't stick to the closer neighbors because there could be other close neighbors that may have a detrimental impact on their decision. Okay? So with this, more or less, this is the idea. This is for an exercise for you. Uh, this is a three level programming problem because we are, as in DRO, the idea is that we are maximizing the impact of the nearest neighbors on the cost. So we are picking the worst selection, we are minimizing the worst, the respective cost associated with the worst selection of the nearest neighbors. Okay? So, and this, I can tell you that this works really nice. Uh, how do we formulate this? With the Sion's Minimax theorem, as we do in the in DRO, we can exchange the, maximum, the minimum and maximum because there are conditions that are satisfied. This is a, it's a linear function over alpha and over the R. Then, plus dualization of the inner maximum, this you can get an LP from this. And this is an exercise that you can have. Okay, how to get an LP from this. Okay, and this is the last, this last slide. Um, this is just, if we take just to show you that this method is very rich. And when I say that this method is very rich, it means that it allows me to find solutions that cannot be found, for example, by other methods, or by, for example, because one of the questions that you can, you can ask me is that, why don't we just increase the value of k? Instead of choosing k equal to two, choosing k equal to three, that would be a very reasonable question. And I can tell you, that is not the same. The solutions for k equal to 2 and k equal to 3 and k equal to 4 are different from the solution that this method are going to give. Because this method is considering much more distributions. Okay? If we pick up the budget of uncertainty like this, there is some theory behind this, uh, how you pick up this, we get well, we, the same as the classical KM, the same thing. But if we increase the budget of, uncertainty, of ambiguity, we can find solutions that are 5.4% cheaper. Okay, and uh, I have already illustrated two, but this can give you 
a wide range of solutions. Okay, one, th one important that I see is that by tuning the budget of the ambiguity, you can ha have less disappointment. You can see that the red one, the classical nearest neighbor, is a very disappointing method because the actual cost is quite very well above the estimated cost, while increasing the budget, you can reduce the disappointment. Okay? Okay, so I was going to do a recap here, but no time, but it would be a, like a summary. So, so I was wondering, did you now you show this between one and the next, in, in reality? Countries and problems very high dimensional with high prices. So how does this work? Because in general, Canaan doesn't go cheaper, right? Yeah, the, in high, the problem of the Canaan is that that are high. The, low, the higher the dimensions, the more data that you need. It's, they, we say that it, it, ha, it, it is cursed, it has the curse of dimensionality, right? The, yes, but then this, this algorithm or this framework does not work. Really well no, the robust, the robust five one works pretty much even without uh, even in higher dimension. And I'm going to the last thing I'm going to show is to show you the papers and uh, the robustification of the thing. The experience that we have in my group is that it works really nice. It works. I mean, it's a very simple thing that uh, surprisingly you can say works uh, much better than expected. And actually, there are some people that believe. That when you rustify the KNN, somehow there should be some theory there that we are we have not found out that tells you that you can break the course of dimensionality when you rustify. And there is a very popular researcher that is Rui Gao that is working on these kinds of things that have proven somehow that even the non-parametric method like KNN they can break the course of dimensionality in some uh, in some uh, under some conditions. Uh, uh, probability. A probability. So you're, you're constraining this to be between 0 and 1 over k, meaning that uh, whatever the worst case is, like you, you, you'll never be assigning a probability more than half. Exactly. It means that at least, at least you have to select two points. You can select three, four, five, but at least two. Because if you select one point, it's impossible with that constraint to, to, to do the summation equal to one. You know? So we say that that constraint, that constraint enforces the amount of mass, the amount of mass that is transported to the context. So the amount of mass that we have to transport to the context is one half, the minimum amount of mass per data point. So two data points in minimum. But uh, unlike the parametric one, you can only uh, learn some weights uh, after solving the optimization problem here. You will be you will have to solve this problem every time. Every time. Yeah, that's that's a problem of non-parametric approaches. Every time that you have a new content, you have to do a new a new nearest neighbors. Right? Every time, every time a new contest comes, you have to, to search in your historical database the nearest neighbors. So that's the different, that's the pros and cons of parametrics. And so that also applies to machine learning. That's the pros and cons. Parametric approaches, once you feed them, you can use it for a long time. Or also, you have to make it then adaptive, otherwise they become old quickly if you have a, a, a fast dynamics in your system. And the non-parametric, they they, um, they 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 adapt quickly to the changes in your database, right? But you have to repeat the same process again and again. So there is no free lunch. Okay. So for me, we are done. Just in case you have any additional question. Well, just maybe just to finish, uh, for you to to you have learned. What is a conditional autocratic optimization problem? And maybe you don't believe it, but we have touched four possible methods in the literature. Traditional forecasting, yeah? a smart predict or value-oriented forecasting. This is the parametric, the parametric rule. Decision rule, 
That's another popular one. And the last one is what we call approximate conditional distribution. Non-parametric methods like the KM, the, the, what they are giving me is an approximate conditional distribution. Okay? So that's it.